In our introduction to issues management, we will have three learning goals. First, we'll introduce issues management within a public relations context. Second, analyze the complexity of issues management in a modern organizational environment. And third, consider the issues management process goals. But before we get into the depth of issues management, we should answer the question, what is issues management? Bob Heath, who is one of the, the founding thinkers, researchers, and practitioners in issues management, makes the argument that it is about stewardship, that organizations have a responsibility for building, maintaining, and repairing their relationships with their critical stakeholders and stake seekers. This notion of relationship management will be really our operating assumption throughout this lecture series on issues management. Because when we deal with issues or even crises, it's vital that we think about how what we do affects our internal as well as our external stakeholders. But as we begin to focus on issues management, we also need to answer the question, what is an issue? Now, in the context of the literature on issues management and the practice of it, it's actually quite specific. So in the context of corporate issues management, issues tend to be viewed as controversial inconsistencies that are caused by gaps between the expectations of organizations and those of their publics. So what happens is that these gaps lead to contestable points of difference. And so when, when these inconsistencies are resolved, they have typically quite important consequences for organizations. So in order, though, for the expectancy violation to emerge as an issue, there actually has to be something controversial about the expectancy or the violation. Now, if you think about anything going on in the news today, whether it's Brexit, whether it's President Trump, whether it's whatever organization happens to be in the news on any given day, most of what makes the news happens to be about these kinds of inconsistencies that an organization has either positively or negatively met our expectations. This notion of the expectation violated comes to us from expectancy violation theory. Now, this theory emphasizes that an individual's perception um, guides us. It guides our behaviors. It guides our attitudes about the organization, about other people. And so while we're communicating or while we're watching an organization or an individual communicate, we create an expectation of how others will react and what people will say. When these aren't met, either someone overperforms and exceeds our expectations or doesn't quite meet them, there is this potential for the expectancy violation. Now, certainly there are cultural values, guidelines that, that govern how we respond and what are appropriate responses to all this. But really, there are two types of expectancies that we make. The first are predictive expectancies. So we ask the question, what do we think is going to happen? And so good, bad, or indifferent we go into an interaction, we see an organization, anything that it could be, we have some kind of assumption about what's going to happen. Those are the predictive kinds of expectancies. The second kind, prescriptive ones, are how we evaluate the ways that people and organizations behave and whether that's really appropriate to an existing environment. So we prescribe what we think an organization or an individual should do based on the circumstances. So the predictive ones and the prescriptive ones tend to work together. But expectancies in people are really determined by three factors. First are interactant characteristics. This really asks the question between an organization and a person, two people, whatever it might be, who is it that, that we're dealing with? So with people, things like age, sex, culture, personality traits, 
create an expectation of a behavior. Likewise, with organizations, we see that different industries, different types of organizations create these kind of interactant assumptions or characteristics. A second type of characteristic are relationship characteristics. So what is the nature of the relationship between people, between people and organizations? This also establishes what we should feel like we're entitled to see, or sometimes in the case of negative expectations, what we expect not to see. The third type of expectancy are environmental expectancies. So this really refers to cultural influences, the social situation, really any factor that can lead to an expectation in the behavior and, and where we think that something should or shouldn't happen. For instance, um, we expect, say, that a, a fitness instructor is going to be rough, but while interacting, we may be surprised if they're actually quite calm and gentle, that they encourage us instead of, instead of trying to push us. The positivity perceived by the listener can then create a much different kind of expectation in the future. But so these kinds of expectancies drive what we think is going to happen across different kinds of organizations and in different kinds of situations. When we look specifically at the organizational context, we want to take a look at the components of issues, and especially as they start to emerge. First, we have to understand that in a lot of cases, stakeholders and organizations' perspectives differ. Now, we'll be talking more about complex environments, stakeholders, and the impact of differing viewpoints uh, in a little while, but suffice to say that organizations and stakeholders and other constituencies may all share concern about the same issue, but their perspectives are often quite different. The role of the issues management process is to really divine and determine the existence and likely impacts of these kinds of contestable points of view differences. Second, there is inherent risk with issues. And this is what makes issues management different, say, from SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis is a general discussion of an organization's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Issues management is not the same thing. It's an active process to identify very specific problems that need to be managed, preferably before they become actual problems. Third, we should also start to understand the issue's life cycle. In simple terms, as the issue moves through the first four stages, it attracts more attention and ultimately starts to become less manageable from the organization's point of view. That is, if this organization's issues management process detects a potential problem in the earliest stages, there are simply more response choices. As the issue matures, the number of engaged stakeholders, publics, and other influencers expands. Positions on the issue itself become more entrenched and that's why the strategic stake choices available to the organization begin to shrink. If and when an issue becomes a crisis, the only available responses tend to be reactive and are even sometimes imposed by external parties. It's also important to note that not all issues reach the crisis stage. And many crises are actually not the result of an underlying issue, but some kind of an event. So take note of the potential stage. This is something we're going to focus on in this, uh, in this lecture series in terms of understanding the process and providing an organization with its greatest value. That is, the issue that never emerges as a crisis because it's managed ahead of time. So why take this focus on issues management? Well, quite frankly, organizations and CEOs expect it. A survey of CEOs reveals that the expectation is that communications chiefs 
are equipped to see around corners, that we're going to anticipate how different audiences will react to different events, messages, and channels. The problem is that even though the majority think that reputation is really important, frankly, a lot of organizations are behind the curve on this. They simply aren't doing enough to actively manage their reputation. So the question then becomes, who really should do the practice of issues management? It's a natural fit for public relations and various disciplines connected like public affairs, communication, and government relations. Because public relations practitioners understand and can play important roles in increasingly complex environments, including promoting bottom line interests of organizations by building relationships. Issues based communication is an important strategic component to issues management, but good decisions about the communication strategies and tactics are more likely to be made by practitioners who understand the full scope of issues management, have extensive knowledge of the organization and its environment, and are really skilled collaborators, people who are equipped to negotiate within and across organizational boundaries. In fact, in a USC Annenberg study of senior public relations practitioners, it revealed that those with direct budgetary responsibility for issues management, something like 40%, were more likely to report to higher level C-suite support. They're more likely to have effective working relationships with other departments. They had larger budgets and they had more access to resources for research evaluation and strategic implementation. This means that when organizations do actually commit to it, it tends to be in the area of public relations and there are an increasing number of resources devoted to it. So it's actually an indicator for anyone who's looking for a job of a highly rated communications team when issues management is well funded and well supported within that organization. So let's take a look then at a more complex version of the issues lifestyle, life cycle, and what it actually means within an organization. This particular view of the issues life cycle leaves out the potential stage because it's really looking at issues that are already emerging. But this gives us a way of looking at an issue life cycle from the corporate perspective. So let's walk through it. First, let's look at the dotted lines. These are the outcome lines. If we start on the left, note the impact line. This is about the impact of issues management. Notice there's a lot that can be done early in the evolution of an issue to positively affect the organization and the issue. In this case, an issue identified and managed early really represents an opportunity for an organization. At the other end of the impact line, however, is the lowest point for public interest. People, for a whole host of reasons, will pay the most attention as issues emerge. However, once they fade from media coverage, people tend not to stay engaged. Yet look at what happens with the cost line. At the point that the organization is getting very little return in terms of reputation and public attention, the costs are actually at their highest. Early in the issues management life cycle, dealing with the issues is relatively inexpensive. Unfortunately, as the issue really emerges, the cost for managing it skyrockets because as more and more stakeholders get involved, there are really different levels of responsibility, regulation, and rules that come into place. Second, let's take a look at the bottom line. These are the phases that an issue can take. Our earlier graphic just looked at the issue emergence into the crisis stage. This particular graphic puts it into a broader context. After, after the issue has emerged and has been made public and starts to move into the political and the legislative spheres, these tend to happen once a material crisis is managed. That is, this really represents these political and legislative spheres the aftermath for the organization. 
this is also why the costs go up so much because once regulations enter there are also monitoring costs new technologies and the like but let me be clear here though issues management isn't and shouldn't be about avoiding crises by covering up problems issues management is a process to focus on proactively solving material and reputational problems before they emerge into the public eye. Third, in the TAN boxes, we see the initial communication strategy coming in with the identification of the issue, formulation of a response strategy, and directly engaging appropriate stakeholders. All the while, the issue is beginning to emerge more and more into the public eye. Certainly, at any stage, the issue can de-escalate. We just show the continuing version. So, as it begins to grow, we see different groups beginning to get involved from public relations, to investor relations, to intelligence, and public affairs. As each of these stakeholders and actors are activated, depending on the issue in the organization, that's when we see the stakes for the organization go up to the pinnacle of the crisis itself, where the job of the organization is trying to manage the outrage, in Peter Sandman's description of what issues management is about. Finally, as the public nature of the issue begins to fade and a crisis subsides, organizations then must ask what lessons they've learned and how to apply new research into differing processes and actions. And then finally, as the issue starts to settle down, organizations tend to focus on corporate social responsibility, that is making sure that the reputation of the organization is rebuilt. But notice how the process both begins and ends with issues management. So in a lot of ways, issues management is really about anticipating stakeholder desires. Organizations engage in issues management if decision makers are actively looking for, anticipating, and responding to shifting stakeholder expectations and perceptions. That's when it can have the most positive impact for an organization. Such responses may be operational and immediately visible. For example, uh, McDonald's made some anticipatory moves away from plastic and paper packaging in the 1990s. In this case, there was an emerging criticism of styrofoam as being harmful to the environment. So McDonald's moved to the wrap and collar, uh, which for their bigger burgers was actually pretty useless. So then they moved back to this clamshell design, but instead of making it out of something that wasn't recyclable, made it out of paper or cardboard so that it was easier to manage on the, on the case of the food, but it was as environmentally friendly as possible. This is a good example of anticipating stakeholders' desires, staying ahead of public opinion instead of always just reacting to it. Other common strategic responses are direct, they can be behind-the-scenes negotiations with lawmakers and bureaucrats. They can be proactive campaigns using paid and earned media to influence how issues are framed. There are a lot of ways to, to approach them. But in terms of the assumption of organizational impact, here I want to really contrast two different approaches to issues management that highlight why it's to an organization's advantage to anticipate stakeholder desires. The hosting of the 2008 Beijing Olympics really prompted substantial changes in China. One of the examples of laws that were changed were a whole group of safety laws and regulations. Naturally, China knew that they would be in the world's eye in a way that they hadn't been before. So laws were introduced um, and, and were really the outcome of lobbying by various stakeholders, including health and safety agencies and car manufacturers, for example. So the emerging trend reflected in the laws was an increased attention being paid to health and safety concerns in Beijing as the city, including things like air quality, motor vehicle safety, and traffic reduction. One of the changes was, that was made was a law that made retrofitting car sunroofs illegal in Beijing. 
this actually left a national manufacturer of these retrofitted sunroofs in major trouble. The manufacturer was caught up in the crossfire of different competing stakeholders' interests and just wasn't able to respond effectively. The outcome for that particular company was substantial and negative. They failed to anticipate the laws coming in or their impact, and it meant financial ruin. By contrast, mad cow disease had been on the issues management radar of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association in the U.S. for years, when in 2003, the first case was identified in the United States. By anticipating the event and mapping out a goal-driven response in advance, the association was able to respond quickly. Now, this was also helped by the fact that only one infected animal had been imported from Canada, and it was quickly identified. But the association's response was multi-layered, including direct consultation with regulators, consumer advocacy groups, and other stakeholders, as well as an intensive national and international news media outreach. They had also had evaluation measures ready to go, and so as a result, could actually identify that beef demand rose by 8% in 2004, and consumer confidence in the American beef industry increased from 88% just before the event in 2003 to 93% at the start of 2005. The takeaway point is this. Issues management is more than just crisis avoidance. It's about understanding how social, political, economic, and even environmental expectations are shifting for an organization and being able to manage those changes. When done well, issues management can even lead to increased profitability. When done poorly, not only can it lead to a crisis, but it may mean that the organization simply cannot function. Yet, the complex organizational environments that today's organizations face make this incredibly difficult. So, this offers us a pretty good picture about the broad range of stakeholders that organizations have to deal with to greater and lesser extents. If we think about issues management as being a process where we're trying to anticipate stakeholder desires, Think about the problems that can come with this. Things like competing interests. How do we possibly prioritize different groups? What are the group's interests in it? And how urgent are their concerns? Organizations have to understand who their stakeholders are and then begin to understand the compelling and competing interests that they have. For most organizations, this is complicated because all of these stakeholders can exist at multiple levels. For example, organ organizations have to manage a range of stakeholders from their internal stakeholders, such as their employees, and increasingly all the way out to international stakeholders. Even where we see overlapping types of stakeholders at different levels, they're not likely the same groups. And even the same type of stakeholder may have complex and competing interests with one another. So this doesn't really, this image doesn't really represent all the possible groups from the last slide. So just think about it this way. It's even more complex as you start to add in all the potential stakeholders. Most of the time, these stakeholders also represent the ones that the organizations actually know about. Now in the le next lecture, I'll introduce a tool for analyzing an organization's stakeholders before the issues management process begins. But as we start to think about the issues management process for now, let's emphasize the key connections. It, at the end of it, it's important that you start to think about issues management as a process that has three core characteristics. First, it is about anticipating problems. Second, it's about detecting and managing emerging trends. And third, it's about understanding that an organization's stakeholders hold the keys to its success, both its internal 
and external stakeholders. And so that as the, the cases of McDonald's and the Mad Cow cases demonstrate, staying ahead of stakeholder interests not only demonstrates a level of social responsibility, but minimizes the costs incurred, not only in terms of the investments in the viability of the organization, but that when well managed, they can lead to increased profitability and success for organizations. In particular, for organizations that are well mission driven. So, for more detailed information and additional research resources, these are some good starting points to make. As you go into your studies, you'll find that at the end of each of these lectures, I'll point out different kinds of resources. These are really just the starting points.